Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, thank you for joining me today for this important topic of prostate health solutions backed by research. Today, the topic of prostate health and prostate cancer is a huge topic. And if I would go in detail into what I want to touch on today, it will take me hours. So I will pick a few important points, share with you some important updates on the research that I've been involved in for almost 25 years, and now there are some very important studies that just came out, human clinical trials. But I will try to use very simple conditions that in, in prostate health, such as BPH and prostate cancer, to a little bit shed light about the about the about the larger context of prostate health. So we can start with talking about BPH, benign prostatic hypertrophy. So we'll discuss contributing factors, integrative solution, and also a very important uh, paper that was just published that was just published uh, and. Uh, Share, share the results. And then we also talk about prostate cancer, a little bit about the facts, integrative options, and we'll discuss the very exciting result of modified cytospective, a multi-center clinical trial in biochemical relapse that where I presented the results in ASCO GU in San Francisco in February. So we'll get going. So BPH is a very common condition. It's really a physiological condition. It's something that happens over time and age for men, and it's a, basically a swelling of the prostate that puts pressure on the, on the urethra, and as a result, it causes different symptoms, urinary symptoms, pain, and sexual dysfunction sometimes. And uh, the question is, what makes it uh, come sooner rather than later? and how can we prevent it and treat it. So we'll touch a little bit about these issues. From a point of view of understanding the prostate as an independent organ, which is really how it's done in Western medicine, to really understanding what else in the body affects the prostate. If we can understand the health of a certain organ from more of a global, holistic approach, this model is what makes the difference between an okay treatment and a great treatment. So again, BPH, as I mentioned, is a very common condition. You can see about 50% between age 51 and 60, and then 90% when we are older than 80. So as we age, the prostate grows and swells, and I won't go into all the mechanisms of action, mainly because of limitation of time. You can understand there are so many people who are who millions and millions, tens and tens of millions of men who have issues. So when the, when the BPH pressurizes the urethra, it creates what we call LATS, lower urinary tract symptoms, that include the urinary frequency and urgency, frequency needing to urinate many times, urgency we can't hold the urine, nocturia getting up frequently at night to urinate. Now nocturia, for example, is a factor that will affect our quality of life because we are not sleeping well. In the same time, stress, anxiety, emotional issues, other imbalances that affect our sleep will cause us to already get up to pee because when we are awake, we are more quickly aware of the need to pee even if it's a little bit. That's an example, for example, about the connection between the heart, which relates to sleep in Chinese medicine, and the bladder. And interesting, they are, they are actually coupled. There is, there is a connection be, be, between them and there are certain herbs and acupuncture points that tie into this relationship, uh, some of the Chinese wisdom. There's a, a symptom of hesitancy where it's hard to start peeing and it's interrupted and the stream is weak and incomplete bladder emptying, which can be an issue that leads to secondary infections, straining, decreased force of stream, dribbling, and the, the pressure on the, of the, on, on the urethra and prostatic problem that can affect ejaculation, causing pain and, this, and the sexual dysfunction. So these are symptoms that uh, many, many men experience in one way or another. And just for you, when you have it, you want to pay attention what makes a difference. Did a, did a good night's sleep make a difference? Did what you eat in the last few days make a difference? Did 
if you exercise it, it makes a difference. And start seeing what affects you. One thing is know what affects somebody statistically, but really medicine is a medicine, modern medicine is a medicine of statistics, real medicine, life medicine is medicine of n equals one, is what works for each of us that matters for each of us. So if we look at the BPH and we see what contribute to BPH, and we can go from genetic predisposition to hormonal imbalances, to diet and lifestyle, to toxicity, to metabolic dysfunction, to aging, and the king of everything, chronic inflammation. So when we look at this, we can really very quickly see and understand that the prostate is really a reflection of multiple health systems that can affect so many other organs. And it is very, very interesting because classically BPH is being treated sometimes by your primary care, but often by a urologist, which is very organ and system specific. But we can see that, especially for prostate, it's unusual how many other systems can affect the prostate. So I wanna, I wanna, I wanna a little bit expand on it in the context of BPH, but please take this comments into prostate cancer, which is much more critical. So the genetic predisposition is one thing that we can determine these days, and I'll touch it, I'll touch, I'll go back to it in a moment. But I want to talk about hormonal imbalances. And hormonal imbalances include two parts. It includes the hormonal deficiencies or excesses, where when you test your hormones, they are too high or too low. But also, how are you breaking down your hormones? What is happening to your hormones when you break them down? Very important. And this is a place where genetic predisposition can affect. If you have certain mutation, certain SNP changes, MTHFR, etc., etc., then you will get hormones that are being processed, for example, in the liver, broken up to less healthy hormones. And in men, while we focus on testosterone and DHT, we have to remember that men at the age 55 have the same level of estrogen, sometimes higher than women. And if we have an inability to break our estrogens properly in the liver, and we have a high F4OH estradiol, or a high ratio of, uh, of 16 to 2 estradiol, and uh, these are unhealthy ratios, this will increase our chances for prostate heal, health issues and specifically for prostate cancer, but also will make the cancer more aggressive. So when we look at, uh, at this, it's just an example. But when we visit back hormonal imbalances, we are aware that the prostate is stimulated and being enlarged by testosterone, but especially by dehydrotestosterone. And when we look at the production of dehydrotestosterone, it's very interesting. It can be produced at the testis on a local level, it can be converted in the prostate. It's produced a significant amount by the adrenals. It's, it has some production in the liver. There's some production in the brain. And there's some production in fatty tissues, depending on different enzymes, a 5 alpha reductase or aromatase, how we are shifting the testosterone. So you can see how multiple systems are affecting the prostate. If we look anatomically, if I go back for a moment, and I look anatomically at the prostate, imagine that above the prostate you got your whole body, right? This is like the bottom of our torso, which means that everything that we have in our body funnels down into this area. We can often see it in the different cancers that we get, and I'll touch on it in a moment. Toxicity is very important for the prostate, and we'll talk about it more in prostate cancer. Metabolic dysfunction, I touched a little bit with hormone, but I will touch later more. And aging, especially for BPH. So the goal with BPH is, first of all, to relieve the symptoms of BPH, to reduce the lower urinary tract symptoms, to improve quality of life, uh, to reduce the prostate size, and if needed, different surgical intervention, which are becoming, becoming more and more refined, but also have to be repeated. So if we look at this as a general level of the prostate health, then the goal initially in prostate health is to address BPH, reduce prostate size. Of course, there's a whole area of prostatitis 
that can clearly contribute to prostate cancer more than DPH, but we decided not to touch on it today because of, uh, of issues of time. And uh, then, of course, how do we prevent the development of prostate cancer? And uh, when we look at prostate cancer, and I'll, I'll talk about it in a separate way soon, we also want to understand the prostate cancer is really a wide array of, of serious conditions where it can be very physiological or can be very aggressive. So when we look at the prevention of development of prostate cancer, we want to look at restoring of hormonal balance, which is what I call hormonal modulation, different than hormonal replacement. We want to look at improved metabolic health, very specific metabolic syndrome, adrenal support, and uh, it's key ones, balance between the adrenal and the thyroid, and uh, metabolic from the point of view of glucose metabolism is critical because elevated IGF-1, insulin growth factors, elevated insulin because of obesity, all of these have an important effect on the prostate and on cancers in general of the pelvis in both men and women. We want to look at diets that are more anti-inflammatory, gluten-free, low glycemic index, high protein, not fried food, and no soft drinks, etc. We want to address nutrient, nutrient deficiencies, establish regular exercise routine. It's very important. There is no better medicine than uh, exercise. I mean, it's remarkable. When we look at, this, at the change in survival after initial cancer treatment, between people who walk regularly and don't, it's 50% reduction. It's unreal. It's the best medicine to ever be discovered and, and totally free. And within, within it, we want to look at the detoxification of heavy metals and environmental toxins, which we'll touch on a little bit later, and stress reduction. Now, it's interesting, we are showing this on the level of prevention of the development of prostate cancer, but all of this will also contribute to BPH and to prostatitis as a package. So, we can have targeted natural compounds and nutrients to support this process. And of course, we have medication, surgical, and other interventions. Uh, more in this in this context today, we're going to focus on BPH, and of course, uh, similar, of course, for prostate cancer. So, when we look at the classical categories for treating BPH, often there is spasm of the of the muscle. Of the, of the bottom of the bladder, which doesn't let the urine flow well, while the upper part is too relaxed and doesn't push the urine out. And for this, we use alpha blockers. And there are different ones, I mean, Flomax, Hydrine, Cordura, I mean, the, um, I've been around for many years. And they can help relatively quickly. The problem is that they have multiple side effects because you can't control the, blo the alpha blocker. They can reduce your blood pressure, causing dizziness, abnormal ejaculation, erectile dysfunction, headache, orthostatic hypotension that I just mentioned, and fatigue. And orthostatic hypotension can be very significant in the alpha blockers because the alpha system is, is the sympathetic system that comes, it's our emergency system, our response system. So if it's blocked and we get up, and now we need the blood, the pressure to go up and sustain our circulation, which has to fight gravity now. If you don't get a response, you can faint, you can feel lightheadedness, etc. Another category that is very commonly used is the 5 alpha reductase inhibitor, inhibitors. So these are important drugs that inhibit the movement from testosterone to dehydrotestosterone. They have an effect on BPH, of course, and they also have an important effect in prostate cancer. For people who use combined hormonal therapy in prostate cancer, it has been a movement since the early 90s, and now it's been getting more and more established. You know, you use a, an LHRH agonist that stops the excretion of testosterone, like uh, Luprolite, or, as an example, and then you use a product that blocks 
the effect on the and the conversion on the prostate like casodex or extending and then I use something that specifically blocks the conversion from testosterone to dehydrotestosterone. The problem is that when you block it, you have a movement to the other direction with increased level of estrogens. And so there is some erectile dysfunction, not the same like when you block uh, the excretion of testosterone, but a significant percentage of normal ejaculation, decreased libido, depression, anxiety, breast enlargement can be severe for some people and it may increase the risk of prostate cancer, especially if the work was done with PROSCA. So there are some classical herbs for prostate health that you see in many formulas, so palmetto, pygium, pumpkin seed, stinging nettle, and these are herbs that have an anti-inflammatory hormonal modulation effect on the prostate, and they will have a benefit in, in a benign in, in BPH and also have some benefit in prostate cancer. There are some studies showing it. Quercetin is a remarkable ingredient. It's much bigger than the prostate. Quercetin is, has an anti-inflammatory effect, has a detoxification effect, has a regulatory effect. For example, quercetin will prevent resistance to chemotherapy in uh, different cancers breast cancer, adriamycin, for example. Quercetin will allow uh, circulating tumor cells to become less aggressive. So quercetin is a very important compound in the prostate specifically. It has an effect on prostatitis, specifically in some on BPH. So if we look at, uh, if we look at uh, how, how to really address prostate health, we have all these multiple categories that I showed you a little bit uh, earlier that has all the categories of hormonal modulation, to addressing toxicity, addressing immunity, addressing circulation, addressing inflammation. So this is really the approach that needs to be taken care of when you go to a holistic doctor who sees the prostate bigger than the prostate. But there's also a way to reflect this in formulation, for example, in this specific formula that has multiple published papers. Uh, that's the idea, that using 33 different ingredients to address the different categories. Now, the presentation is not specifically on this formula, but if you look at such a formula, you will see how the different organs that address an issue are addressed by, by, by different ingredients. So the study on the prostate health supplements if it was a retrospective study on 65 men uh, evaluating their change in lower urinary tract symptoms. 65 men, 20 with prostate cancer, 30 with BPH, 21 with multiple diagnosis, meaning BPH, prostate cancer, prostatitis maybe, and 11 with no formal diagnosis. Now this specific formula for more serious conditions, you go up to 12 capsules a day. But interesting, some of the subjects to address just their urinary issues used only two capsules a day. It was unusual, usually two twice a day, and still we gained benefits. And at least two months was the inclusion criteria, but most of the people on this study have been using this for years. So we are seeing a long-term benefit. It's something important. When you design a formula in a synergistic way, you don't lose the benefits over time compared to a drug where you often get tolerant. So that's another very unique feature of a natural holistic approach that is important to recognize. So when we looked at the improvement in symptoms based on questionnaires given to the 65 subject, we saw 60.7% improving staining, 61%, about 44% in intermittency, similar effect in weak, improvement of weak stream, in complete emptying, and then significant improvement in you know, urgency in obturia and frequency. And although the percentage for, for, for urgency may look lower compared to, to what the placebo does, it actually was very significant. So we understand that benign prostatic health is universal, has a significant impact on quality of life, but it does not threaten your life, it does not lead directly to prostate cancer. What we really have to be concerned about and be aware of is prostate cancer. 
The prostate cancer is the second most common cancer in men, and uh, other than skin cancer, is the most common cancer in the U.S. And uh, about one in seven men will be diagnosed with cancer, and the estimated number of men with prostate cancer is, you know, close to three million people, two million seven hundred thousand people. If caught early, like many other cancers. It is one of the most treatable malignancies, and it's a qualified statement. There are certain prostate cancers that are so aggressive that they're going to show up regardless of what, they're going to reoccur regardless of what we do, but we don't have time to go into this in greater detail, we can touch it. What's very important is, uh, you know, while we understand it's the second leading cause of cancer death in American men behind lung cancer, and uh, we want to look at the, it's the average age. So the average age is 66%, which still seems like it's a disease of old people. It comes, no, we shouldn't say old people, but not the uh, young people. But we have to understand, when we look at this data, we really have to understand it's what's happening. So our, our survival goes up. Many more people live to their 80s and to their 90s. And just like BPH, many men as they age and get older into the 80s, 90s, can come up with what I often call physiological prostate cancer. A low-grade Gleason 6 prostate cancer. Gleason is a reflection of the aggressiveness of the prostate cancer, with the lowest one being diagnosed as cancer is 6, and a very aggressive one is 10, which relates to genetic mutation and aggressiveness of the cancer. So if we can look at 66 as, the, as an average, and we have two men who got prostate cancer at the age 80, they will actually balance somebody at the age 38 that got prostate cancer. And we see now men in their 30s coming up with prostate cancer, very often more aggressive prostate cancer. Why is the prostate cancer more aggressive? One, because the person's metabolism, physiology, activity is faster. Everything is moving faster. And second, because more extreme factors were needed to produce prostate cancer over a shorter period of time. We also have to remember when we look at these statistics that now with PSA very commonly done compared to 30, 40 years ago, we are finding this benign, non-aggressive prostate cancer at later age that we would have not found in the past. People would just die with prostate cancer that nobody knew about. And this also skews the age to a higher age. So the take home, takeaway point is don't disregard the possibility of having prostate cancer at a young age. The other thing that I didn't dedicate a slide to and I want to add is the whole story of PSA. So for me personally, always PSA has great value. PSA testing has great value when done appropriately. When, when it's done one, in the context of how big is the prostate, because if the PSA is high with a very large prostate, it's less worrisome because we can explain the PSA. So if you have somebody where the digital rectal exam or an ultrasound shows a small 30 ml prostate, 20 ml, even 25, you really expect these people to have under 2 PSA and they come with 4.5, it's a concern. But if somebody has a huge prostate, which is 80 ml, and the PSA is 5.6 or 6, it can all exp be explained by the normal excretion from the tissue. The other part is that high PSA with urinary symptoms is less worrisome than high PSA without any symptoms. Because again, we can explain it. So in my perspective, I've, I use PSA to understand the patient, and then I look at many other metabolites and many other factors both in the one-on-one -on -one care and both as I formulate uh, products in this, in this arena. So, what is the integrative approach to, to, to prostate cancer, which I touched about a little bit before? So, we can see the approach to prostate cancer is multi-prone. I want to emphasize that from a, from a conventional medicine point of view, there's a lot of exciting new treatment. I just had a chance to present at ASCO, GU, ASCO Genital Urinary Annual Conference in San Francisco in February on our study on modified citrus spectrum, which I will share in a moment. 
and there was some very big news about uh, uh, some new drug extended for long-term uh, prostate cancer patient or failing hormonal therapy and this is good news but the drug that you are going to get is not driven by who you are but what but by which mechanisms of action are driving your treatment it's sometimes remarkable for example if we look at the field of immunotherapies like pdl1 inhibitor or ctl4 inhibitors you check for the receptors for these molecules and i won't go into the detail of what they are but even in mega large institutes you know the largest cancer institute they will not try to understand the immune system in a deeper, more comprehensive way because it's not needed, it's not indicated to give the drug. So this is, as we make progress, these drugs are important, but we really want to understand what is driving the condition because for each of us, there are different things. So as I often say, conventional treatments for cancer can get very good results. So let's say we look at at the breast cancer, which is not the topic, or often a chemotherapy is a very late stage in prostate cancer, but a certain treatment that is a 70% response. It doesn't matter which doctor you go to, you're going to get the same treatment with 70%. It will take an integrative doctor a lot of work, creativity, and unique know-how to take it up from, let's say, 70 to 72, or 75, or 80, or 82. So, you know, let's say you take it up to 80. Well, you reduced the risk, you, you improved the response, the survival of the 30% by one-third. But what's so important that when we do it, we have a very important side effect. We feel better emotionally, we feel better physically, we are more productive, we are happier. That's part of an integrative approach. So I want to emphasize this because you can always integrate it into your care. So looking at these factors now, we want to look at some important uh, issues. So immune enhancement is very important. It's not as important in hormonal-driven tumors, but we do want to have a good immune response, and we want to make sure that the immune response can get to the cancer cell. What do I mean? We can have a strong immune response that, let's say, will increase certain... Uh, a compound that can kill cancer like tumor necrosis factor alpha, TNF alpha. If the tumor is shielding itself from the system, it's coating itself with the system, the, the compound will not be able to get to the cancer. And if the cancer is shielded and creates a microenvironment with its own metabolic environment, its own pH, its own growth factor, it becomes an independent entity within our body, and our immune system doesn't have the way to address it. So immune enhancement is not such a simple concept, and we now see it. We see it, for example, with immunotherapies that can give benefits, but the benefits are related also to side effects, to inflammatory side effects, because, the, because there is no change in the local tissues. If you fight it and there's already inflammation, it will become worse. The other part which is very important in prostate cancer is hormonal and metabolic modulation. And modulation is beyond just hormonal therapy. We have to understand the patient hormonally before you take your first treatment. I always say this is a map, this is a baseline, and if we don't take a good picture, we can never come back. So for example, in the clinic, I will run a lot of blood tests. No, of course, testosterone and, the, and, and DHT and total estrogen and, and, the, and the different estrogen and IGF-1 and prolactin and the hemoglobin A1C. And I want to see the relationship between them. I will look at different, a different compound that can affect them. And then I want to look at metabolic factors, thyroid function, adrenal function, cortisol, and see how they relate to each other in the specific person, why is this so important if you're going to give the same drug? Because if you take a good snapshot of what happened before you start treating, you are being shown the road that got you into this situation, and then when you want to backtrack 
makes the treatment more effective or continue holistic approaches after formal therapy, that's so important to really understand. Very, I can't emphasize this enough. And uh, not done often enough, I, I regret, because we live uh, because of cost in insurance-driven medicine. So then when we look at this, we want to look at direct cytotoxicity. How can we directly attack the cancer? If it's botanicals, uh, if it's other compounds, etc. So direct cytotoxicity and, and, and redifferentiation are closely related. One of them tries to kill, and one of them tries to make the cell normal. So for example, certain things like vitamin D, vitamin A, sodium phenylbutyrate, honokiol, which is key, helps in redifferentiation. Modified citrospectin also does it because the more there is an expression of galactin-3, the more the cancer mesenchymal cells and the cancer stem cells become more aggressive. It's actually a key mechanism. We want to balance addressing both of them, either in the same time or if you're getting a certain treatment within the treatment cycle. So for example, in my, uh, in my clinic, I adjust the supplements based on what someone is doing in a dynamic way where it changes over, let's say, somebody gets a certain treatment every three weeks, the supplements will change. Again, I try to reflect this as much as I can in, in a simple supplement. That's why you need so many ingredients. We also want to recognize detoxifications. Heavy metal environmental toxins have direct effect on the prostate. Why? Because heavy metals are heavy. And the prostate is the lowest part in our torso. So naturally, heavy metals will sink into this area. If we look at cancer in men, in children, we can get, of course, different bone marrow cancers, you know, and central nervous system cancer that relate a little bit to the same system in Chinese medicine. And then uh, we can get osteosarcoma, cancer of the bones below the pelvis, usually. And then the first cancer we get is we get testicular cancer. And afterwards, we start moving upward, and we get prostate cancer similar in women, in their cancers. So we can see how the toxicity is sinking into the bottom. And that's where dietary changes, detoxification, herbs, removal of heavy metals can be very important. In the same category with conditions, with, with related importance, is addressing circulation of, in hyperviscosity. If the blood is too thick, if the circulation is not normal, we'll get tissue which is, has hyperoxidation, doesn't have enough oxygen, it becomes more acidotic, more lactic acid. Lactic acid uh, increases hypoxia-inducing factors, which again shuts down the mitochondria because the mitochondria can function. There's no oxygen that can produce energy. And now it's a vicious cycle. And for example, a drug like metformin is very important in addressing it. And more effective is honokiol. Honokiol will specifically address the metabolic component that will affect redifferentiation from the point of view of re-establishing normal mitochondrial function, turning an abnormal cell into a normal cell, but also because there is more, uh, more uh, cyclic AMP being produced, then there is more normal function of the cell. So that's an example of one compound like onochiol that can work in so many places and has this very unique quality to, to recognize cancer cell and treat it differently. And then prevention of metastasis and angiogenesis, where modified introspecting is the leading compound with solid data in vitro, in vivo, and multiple human clinical trials. So let's talk a little bit about galactin-3 and modified introspecting. That's a field that I've been, been involved with for almost, almost uh, 25 years, for 23 years now. And I'll share with you just some highlights because there is too much to share in a few minutes. Uh, modified citrospectin binds and blocks the adverse effect of galactin-3. Galactin-3 is a protein that binds carbohydrates. So it binds oxidized glycolipids, glycoproteins, and when it binds, it creates a lattice formation 
covering the cover that covers the tumor cells and, and allows the tumors to hide, a cover that allows, that shuts down the response of the immune cells and has a lot of other effects in inflammation and, and fibrosis. But specifically in cancer, extracellular galactin 3 will promote, as you can see in the slide, aggregation of cancer cells, tumor growth, invasion and migration of the tumor, immune evasion, I explained briefly how, by surrounding the, the, the tumor cells, angiogenesis, growth of new blood vessel because VGF, endothelial growth factor attaches to the galactin 3, inhibition of apoptosis, the cell cannot just die and keeps living, and metastasis. The initial work in modified cytospectin was specific on metastasis with papers published in the leading journals. So galactin 3 really is a master conductor of the tumor microenvironment. It stimulates proliferation and inhibits apoptosis, intracellular effects, it stimulates migration, promotes invasion, metastasis formation, cell-to-cell -cell interaction, and stimulates angiogenesis, inhibits immune surveillance, environmental regulation. So you can see how the levels are coming from benefits inside the cell, how cell-to-cell -cell interaction, and how there's effects that affects the whole system. Very unique. So while galactin-3 inside the nucleus of the cell has important issues, when it comes into the cytoplasm of the cell and when it comes outside, it really serves to repair injury. And it repairs injury by causing inflammation and fibrosis. And it has a detrimental effect on every chronic condition. And the initial interest was specifically on cancer. And we've been studying now the effect of galactin-3 blocker modified it respected in prostate cancer for 23 years. So this is really how we talked about these three, three categories, and you can see how together they will just make cancer survive and become more aggressive. So what is modified citrus pectin? Pectin is a low complex chain of uh, polysaccharide fiber, galacturonic acid. You can see it uh, below the blue chart. Most of it is esterified, the one in green, and a few of them are not esterified, and it has neutral sugars like rhamnose or rabinose, which are very important for immune recognition, for detoxification. It also has rhamnogalacturonan 2 and our specific modified it prospectin we published with the USDA, 10% rhamnogalacturonan 2 which is a compound present in mistletoe, which is a main immune enhancer. So in order for it to be beneficial, we have to cut it to a very low molecular weight so it can get easily absorbed by the GI tract. And we have to create a certain structure that will be biologically active and will exert its benefit. And we have shown now, by developing an antibody to our modified cytospectin, that it can actually be absorbed into the blood where it can create its benefit. And let me say a word about modified cytospectin. It's really a generic name because every pectin has to be modified to be produced. It has to be pulled out of the peel. And as our research continues, as we're now just finishing two double blind clinical trials on osteoarthritis and hypertension with Harvard, as we published more than 40 papers on our specific modified citrus pectin on pectus OC, there's a lot of powered science. So you really want to make sure that you are using the specific preparation that was researched that is where the, the discoveries were, were, were made of because it's a really important dietary supplement fiber which is a must for every person. So I'm just touching very briefly on the research on modified cytospectin in prostate cancer, especially on the two most important human clinical trials. So that's our phase two pilot study. It was done on 10 men with biochemical prostate cancer relapse using 15%, 15 gram a day for one year. These patients were off any drugs for six months, and we had a very significant improvement in the study. This is a study with biochemical relapse, which means the prostate was removed, there is no prostate, and PSA is zero, or next to zero. And then it starts coming back as the cancer reoccurs. And as it reoccurs, the speed of elevation of, of uh, 
of PSA is proportional to the growth of cancer, well established. And we're able to slow it down to increase the time it takes for the PSA to double in 7 out of 10 men with p-value under 0 0.01 in, with the eighth one in, uh, if it was under 0 0.05. So you can see that even the, even a probation number four still had a slowing down of the process, but it wasn't under 0.01. Now these are all patients with clinically significant prostate cancer, which is growing fast. Why is this so important? There are some other compounds that take down PSA, because it, we do it in a non-hormonal mechanism. We do it without manipulating the hormonal picture, because once we change the hormonal expression of prostate cancer, we start messing up with the biology of the cancer. Modified citrus pectin is so unique that it binds to galactin-3. It, uh, it shuts down all of these aggressive mechanisms. It enhances the immune system. It removes heavy metals. And it can do it on a long-term basis because it's not hormonally involved. We develop hormonal adjustments. So, interesting, the same data was presented, uh, actually, no, this is a different slide. I was going to show you another slide, but I don't think we shared it this time. That's an example of uh, one of the patients. So, if we were just affecting the metastasis, you would get a straight line because the primary tumor will still grow. But you can see where the error is. That the moment we start giving modified citrospectin, we checked it for six months before, it was a straight line, linear increase. It immediately affects the PSA rise, which means it's affecting the growth of the primary tumor and the metastatic process. And that's because of its anti-angiogenesis effects. And for example, in this patient, it's 20 months. Look how it's flattening at the end. So you understand every day that modified citrospectin slows down the growth of cancer, is a net day of life because we are not messing with the hormonal mechanism which creates mutated tumors and more aggressive tumors. So we are now, uh, we've been engaged now for four years in what was supposed to be a phase three double blind clinical trial, but because of slow recruitment was changed to phase two B, multi center prospective uh, study that is testing the effect of pectosomodified cytospectin in the treatment of PSA dynamics in non-metastatic biochemically relapsed prostate cancer. I'm just reading you the title from the ASCO 2018 poster presentation. And uh, this was a pre-planned analysis of 50% uh, of the patients. And uh, so after we have 50% of, more than 50% of the patient finished uh, six months, we are presenting it, and we expect in these patients that 80% of the patients will progress in six months. And right now we already have 45 patients enrolled, and we hope to publish data on 50 patients, so longer term uh, data. So what did we do in this study? We took patients with biochemically relapsed prostate cancer after primary tumor treatment, either surgery, radiation, or both. We confirmed rising PSA monthly times three, so we had a straight line and we could calculate the doubling time. We confirmed that testosterone is at normal levels. There is no androgen deprivation treatments for at least three months. And the PET scan or bone scan plus CT scans are negative. Patients were evaluated monthly, and they were receiving six months of oral MCP therapy, 4.8 grams three times a day. And disease status, PSA, and scans at six months. And then we divided it to no progression, which means it stopped going up. Remember, 100% of these patients are progressive right now. And if they progress, they will take it off the study. And when we and progression we defined as 25% increase in PSA from baseline or scan progression or, or limiting toxicity. And I want to mention it's a little bit of an issue because you can, you can have somebody, you can have somebody whose PSA is going up very quickly, you improve them, but they still went up by 25% during six, four months, let's say, because before they would go up by 
and still they will not qualify even if you're actually helping them. So the results were fascinating. First of all, in general, 79% of the 34 patients benefited from modified cytospectin, which is remarkable. Out of this, out of these patients, 62% uh, of the 100%, out of the 79%, most of them, because 62% out of 100, so out of the pie of 79%, and I can't show you with the pointer because it's on your screen, 62% the PSA became flat or went down. 17% it continued to go up but slower than before. Only 21% of the patients had no PSA doubling time improvement. Most of them just the PSA going up and only 9% had a change in finding the scan. So, and this very strongly confirmed our observation of the benefit of modified citrus spectrum. So again, to summarize here, all patients had consecutive rise in three PSAs, 62% had no progression, 21 of 34, stable or decreasing PSA levels, and there were no safety issues. The most common side effect was bloating, which is dose-dependent and usually goes away. So very exciting, very exciting confirmation of the benefits of that. But what was interesting for us is uh, to hear what's the impression of some patients who have been involved in the study for a long time. The study is for six months. If you get results, you continue for one year. But as you can see, people who are done with the study just keep on using the product. In fact, even some people who didn't get formal results with supposedly progressed end up sometimes using it. So it's interesting to read, like, you know, the, uh, the first person in the last two years I consume Pectosol C three times a day, I feel energetic with good mood and appetite. The overall feeling is much better than the previous period. PSA has been stable for 18 months and, uh, and interesting. But what's interesting for us is that, and it's a reflection of this approach of the wisdom of nature, that the side effect of, of using something like modified retrospective very unique to modified retrospective is that somebody feels more energetic, in good mood, and overall feeling is much better. For the other person, he took MCP consistently for two years, and after three months his PSA was better, and no skin evidence of having tumor until today, two years, but he says, I literally feel an improvement in my health and keep me feel good. He stopped for two months, PSA went up, and then when he restarted, it stopped again. What's interesting about it is this feeling good, feeling better, less joint pain, better memory, better mood, it all relates to blocking the effects of galactin-3. And that's why if you look at the charts of my patients seven, eight years ago, I recommend, of course, modified introspective, but you would not see it at the top of the list. It was one of the important things. I now feel strongly that every person needs to take modified introspective because modified retrospectin is directly related to aging and to every chronic disease. The topic today is prostate cancer, uh, but, and uh, that's what we'll focus with the dosing, but for me it's the number one supplement that people need to take. So if we look at how to use modified retrospectin, the for people with active prostate issues, especially cellular issues, you can use one scoop three times a day or one and a half scoops twice a day, which is equivalent to six capsules, or according, or according to guidance from your health, pro, health, health practitioner. And you can also, you can also when using the Pectosol C, if you're using it just for prevention for good health, then five grams is very effective. It's really useful. It's important to understand it and good to be taken on empty stomach, but even 15, 20 minutes before food is okay. And for prostate, for prostate health, if there's an active serious condition, you can go up to six capsules twice a day. Maintenance is two capsules twice a day. And we have published on the synergistic effect between prostate and pectosol C. So to summarize our webinar, better prostate, uh, uh, BPH, benign prostatic hypertrophy, affects 50% of men over 50, 90% of men over 80. BPH symptoms significantly impact quality of life. 
Prostate cancer is the most common cancer in men. We talk a little bit in a little bit in depth in a quick way about a little bit of a different way of looking at prostate cancer. And we talked that there are evidence about the benefits of prostate in BPH and modified its respect and so important in prostate cancer. So I thank you very much. If you need any questions, please uh, please uh, send to info at Better Health Publishing. I want to thank Better Health Publishing for hosting me. I got a, quite a few questions which I will answer maybe in writing, but one question that I got a few of them is, which I kind of answered, is is the use of modified retrospectin restricted to prostate cancer? And the answer is obviously not. It's not restricted just to prostate cancer with evidence in multiple cancers because of the galactin-3, but it really addresses inflammation and fibrosis, which drives chronic disease. The other part is, does modified retrospectin remove heavy metal? It's another question. Yes. We have a number of clinical trials showing that modified retrospectin can remove heavy metals with lead being a leading one, but also mercury and other ones, any ones that are positively charged. So I want to thank everybody for your time, and we will, after reading, after reading the, the, the questions, we'll get back to you in writing, and I hope to see you or hear you, or I hope for you to join me again for other topics which I hope to offer now more frequently